worth it. Yeah. I am so delighted that we get to share together and celebrate Jesus in an Independence Day because I, I'm so grateful that we get to be having this moment, have the freedom to worship Jesus today. Look, I know from personal experience, and I get that we're not a perfect nation. We're the best nation there is. We are. So we are, I'm extremely grateful that you're here. We're going to have a good day today because we're going to open up God's word together and hear what he has to say to us. Because we're not just going to celebrate the freedoms that we have in this country. More importantly, we're going to look into the freedom that Jesus gives us. And today, we're going to continue our series on the book of Jonah. And last week, I didn't introduce the tagline, but I want to just kind of press it and move forward with this tagline. And the tagline for our series at the book of Jonah is simply this, how to get out of an impossible situation. Out of curiosity, have you ever been there? Like, I'm sunk for good this time. I'm in too deep. And it may not be the totality of our lives, but there are some aspects of our lives, perhaps, some relationship, some opportunity, some potential, something about our future that has seems to us we are barred from because of choices we've made or even choices others have made for us. See, the book of Jonah is incredibly relatable. All of Scripture is. But we're going to see in the book of Jonah ourselves. There's so much. And today, we're going to get to the portion of Scripture where Jonah is in the belly of a great fish. And some of you are pushing back on it, but you know what just happened not too long ago? June 11th, for that matter. If you would like to look up later on, not right now, you can fact check me later, but according to Cape Cod Times, on June 11th, a man by the name of Michael Packard. He is a professional lobster diver. And why he is noted in that article is because he was swallowed by a humpback whale. For real. It actually happened. In fact, according to this article, Packard initially thought it was a great white shark. Then he did one of those, I have no holes. It's not a shark. And then he finally dawned on him, it was a whale. And this is what he said, and and these are his quotes. I was completely inside. It was completely black. I thought to myself, there's no way I'm getting out of here. I'm done. I'm dead. And all I could think of was my boys. They're 12 and 15 years old. See, when you find yourself... Inside the mouth of a whale, that is a natural and logical conclusion. Would you agree? Now, Jonah found himself inside a great fish. It is what all of us can look at and go, yeah, if there's an impossible situation, that's one of them. Now, in the book of Jonah, we're going to address more than one of these situations more than one impossible issue. But when you're inside of a great fish, you're a goner. That's a natural, logical conclusion to come to. And maybe that's where some of us are here today, sitting where we are. We're in a situation. And it may not be descriptive of the entirety or the totality of our lives, But we may say to ourselves, relationally, my life is over. Vocationally, my life is over. We may be able to, we may be saying, you know what? No. I cannot get out of my finances. My financial future is over. There are all kinds of issues that are pulling at us. (laughs) There are issues that come upon us because of the choices we've made or because some of the choices others have made that are close to our lives, because we talked about that in the first message. And we are, all of us, all of a sudden, in too deep. 
What do you do when you're in too deep? What do you do? Well, if you have your Bible, open your Bible to Jonah chapter 2. If you don't have access to the scriptures, no worries. We're going to have the passage projected for you on the screen, so if you'll follow along with me as I read out loud. Let's all stand as we honor the reading of God's awesome word together. Jonah chapter 2, beginning of verse 1, it says, From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I've been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord, my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this is a celebration of freedom. And help us to drink deeply, live more deeply, express more deeply of the freedom that we can find in Jesus Christ. We pray all of this in his name. Amen. Please be seated. All right. Now, there are important truths when it comes to addressing this particular impossible situation, the impossible situation, circumstance we've dug ourselves into, we have plummeted ourselves and, and found ourselves the in too deep from, right? What are we supposed to do? We're going to address four quick things. I encourage you to write them down. Some of you are saying, but I'm not in an impossible situation right now. Well, as one author observed, the reality of life, the human experience is this. We're either about to go into a problem, or in a problem, or getting out of one. Bottom line is, we're going to need these shoes at one point or another. So let's not just listen. Let's take heed, apply it to our lives, and not let go of these shoes. And the first thing we see is this. Write it down. Impress them inside your life and, and live it out as a reality of our being. Recognize the true source of salvation. Recognize the source of salvation. Verse 2. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord. Let me just pause real quick. Isn't it true that's typically when we call to the Lord? It's not when we see the light. It's when we feel the heat. You tracking with me? It's when we're in a tight. It's when we feel like we've gone sunk too deep. In my distress, I called the Lord and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help. You can't get lower than the grave. You see, the whole trajectory of Jonah's life, some of you were here last week, and we found that because Jonah ran away from God, who is the source of our salvation, he's the only true source, he finds himself going down. When you're going away from the Lord, you are in a downward trajectory. Scripture tells about how Jonah went down. Jonah went down to Joppa, went down into the ship. He laid down to go to sleep, which eventually turned out that he was thrown into the sea where he sank down to the sea, and he eventually ended up in down the belly of a great fish. There's a lot of down there, right? So, and you listen to my cry, despite 
despite how down Jonah was. And the great news is, no matter how impossible your circumstance may be, no matter how difficult it may feel, there is hope for you. But in order for us to take hold of hope, we have to recognize the source of salvation. We have to understand where that ultimately lies. Jonas was in a situation where no one else can help. Have you ever been there? What do you do? See, when you're in a no-win situation, when you're in a no-out situation, when we're really honest and assess where we are, we don't go after other things. You know, I hear that there are no atheists in foxholes. When the bullets start flying and when the bullets of life start flying in our lives, it is the most natural thing to cry out to God. All of us have probably some awareness of this of some degree or another. Some of you have been in church before and you've heard this type of reality, this truth from the scripture that Jesus is our hope. He is our life. In fact, John 14, 6 says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But why don't we turn to him? If that's true, why is it every one of us running to Jesus? But the truth is, too many of us are stuck in our situation. We wallow in our suffering. And it's one of the big reasons why we find ourselves there is because of this thing called shame. Have you ever been shamed before? I have. Just out of curiosity, you out there? Uh, have you experienced shame before? All of us have. We have. And it's not a good game. None of us like it. We blew it. We know it. And even though we posture ourselves as if, as if we did nothing wrong, many of us carry the crushing weight of our guilt. And shame keeps us. Because we can't bear up under the weight. We don't want to answer to all that we have to answer to. We don't want to face the consequences of all the stuff because we just want to say, <laughs> and we just, that's why we find ourselves almost sequestered in our shame. And it's very much like the beginning of human history. It really is. It goes all the way back. This situation, this problem, it goes all the way from the beginning of humanity. Adam and Eve. God put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Perfection. The Garden of Eden, the word Eden means delight. That's how wonderful it was. And God told Adam, you can eat from any fruit in the garden except one. Right? Adam, you only had one job. Just one. He didn't do it. Adam and Eve both broke God's instructions, sinned, and ate from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what was his response from that? He hid from the presence of God. He ran. Just like Jonah ran. Just like the way we run. See, we have that in common with Jonah. Our natural tendency too often isn't to run toward him, it's to run away from him. And that's what we share in common with Jonah. But the good news is, God doesn't turn away from us when we do. God didn't say, Adam, ah, he's gone. I'll start over. What did God do? 
the book of Genesis tells us he came and walked where Adam was and called out his name. God came looking for him. Just the same way that God did for Jonah. What did he do with the runaway prophet? Did God say, forget him. Obadiah, you're up. (laughs) No. God said, I'm coming after you. I'm not letting go of you and provides a great fish. You know, God is chasing us today. He is. The way he chases us is through the cross. At every stage of our lives, there is a crossroad for us to keep running away or begin running toward. And the cross is the good news that we have that we can go back to him and recognize the true source of our salvation. See, the good news is God does not play the shame game. He doesn't. Yeah, you heard me. Now, I understand we do, but he doesn't. In fact, he's not looking at us, and because of our rebellion, he doesn't doesn't look down upon saying, oh, shame on you. No, Jesus went to the cross, and in so doing, Jesus said, your shame is on me. I paid the price. I paid the cost of your rebellion. I'm not going to nail you for what you've done. I'm going to nail your shame to the cross. That's the good news. That's why we have hope. But we have to recognize the true source of our salvation. God leads us to conviction, but never condemnation. Romans 8, chapter 1 says, Therefore, there is now no How many? No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Don't let shame keep you from turning to him. Don't let it. I understand it might be a knee-jerk reaction from us because of all that we've gone through, because all that's happened, because of... Don't. But there's something else we need to recognize from chapter 2 of Jonah. Not just recognize the source of our salvation, but realize what got you to this point. Realize what got you here. I find it very interesting that those who do not follow Jesus, those who actually are, 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 are even antagonistic of Christ followers, they look at our faith and go, you know what? Your faith, all that is, it's just a crutch. It's, a, it's how you manage. It's a, it's a coping mechanism for you to deny reality that you face. Following Jesus never denies reality. Following Jesus actually awakens us to reality. Jonah certainly didn't deny reality. Let's go back to the passage. Verse 3, you hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All the waves and breakers swept over me. Is that a guy in denial? I don't think so. He's sinking, and he knows it, right? Verse 5, the engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. The salt water was stinging his eyes, filling his lungs, and he was wearing seaweed like a turban. Okay? He's not denying reality. He's staring straight at death, and he knows it. Verse 6, to the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me forever. He was so far down, it's as if he heard the chink. You know, I've seen the movies. I've never been there. But, you know, that scene when you're in jail and the bars go chink. Is that how it sounds, Andrew? Not that you've been, he's he's an (laughs) ex-policeman. I'm like, oh, what did I just do there? (laughs) No, he was a policeman. That's why he knows. Okay. (laughs) Okay, my bad. We need to edit this later, guys, just so you know. Okay. Uh, (laughs) 
clink barred me in forever. There's no denial, denial here. Sunk is sunk. Down is down. No way out is no way out. Faith is never a denial of reality. It's opening our eyes to all of reality. See, people who are followers of Jesus Christ who are sick admit that they're sick. People who are followers of Jesus, financially speaking, they're broke. <laughs> they admit they're broke. We still go to funerals, right? See, following Jesus means that we see all of life in the raw, in the real. Jesus warned us in advance, told us in advance. If you follow him, look, he said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world, is what he said. See, Christ followers fully see the realities of this world, but they also see the risen Savior in this world. We see more than simply the reality of our circumstance. We see the Savior. See, Jonah saw the reality of his situation. He assessed why he was there. He evaluated all of this, and he came and landed on this conclusion. And that's why we need to do what we need to do in terms of this point. Because by the goodness of God, what God provides us is a way for us to profit from our problems. He's not going to waste any hurt on us. He wants to use it to help us if we'll let him. He wants us to learn so that we don't find ourselves in the same impossible situation again. So we need to recognize why we are where we are. And in verse 8, he evaluated and came to this conclusion. It says, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Isn't that interesting? All that running, all that rebellion, all of that, whatever the details of our disobedience may be, he reduced it to this thing. He said, it's idolatry. Now, some of you be thinking, Talon, idolatry. Look, I have no figurines in my house. I have no golden statue or anything like that. No, no, no. Idolatry doesn't mean stuff like that. Idolatry is much more inclusive than that. See, pursuing an idol simply means that we have something that we love more than, we depend on more than God. See, when we have something that is of higher authority in our lives, what, a, what we prize more than God God in his loving care, because he's the, only, he's the only true source of our salvation, he loves us enough to say, don't go there. Why? Because it's not going to help you in the long run. You know what denying reality oftentimes is? Here's what we do in our society. We scroll and we read, and we finally constantly have to busy ourselves with activity, with noise, with information. Why? Because we never want to really slow down and stay in the silence because we don't want to face all the reality that we're going through. That's reality. Let me tell you why that's a worthless idol. That's a worthless pursuit ultimately. It's not because you shouldn't be informed. But if we're just about finding ourselves keeping our busy, we never address the root issue of our problem. You know, Jesus says, evaluate, see what the problem is, because we are looking at this thing called social media or Netflix or pornography or that hobby, that shopping, that activity, that food, whatever, or that even that relationship. We can leverage those things 
And while those may things may actually be good in and of itself, because after all, relationships, family, for example, oh, it's a gift from God. It's a good thing. But the problem is, is that all of us have this proclivity to make a good thing a God thing. And we are to enjoy the good things, but we need to worship God. In fact, the word worship is from the understanding of worship. Because we will worship that which we, we believe is of ultimate worth. And what the issue for us is that when we do not realize and evaluate, we will find ourselves pursuing good things and making them God things. And perhaps even inadvertently find ourselves pursuing things that are worthless in the long run. Not because, again, family is important. I'm not denying those things. And what I'm getting at is, when it comes to our impossible situation that only God can get us out, he's the only one that can get us out. What we find, what we need to do instead is simply say, okay, what is it that I've allowed to get in the way? Here's what I've discovered a lot of times happening among the Bible Belt people, you know, the, the people who go to church. We say we worship Jesus, but if we're really, really honest, because of the way we spend our time, because of the way we spend our money, because of the things that we involve ourselves in and commit ourselves to, we actually say we love Jesus, but we leverage Jesus for our own end. We use Jesus to get at what we really want. Let me ask you this question. Is God God enough for you to follow? Now, logically, it, it can make sense, right? Yes, if, he's, if there's a God, why shouldn't we? Because he's the basis and the source of all the good things. All that's good and true. Where are you? What do you depend on most? What gives you the most delight? What do your thoughts go to predominantly over the course of a day? And you will find that which consumes you. And whatever consumes your thoughts your resources is typically that which we worship. And so we need to recognize what got us in the situation, but there's more. We need to go beyond recognizing and so that we don't make the same mistake again. We need to rely on God's word. The prayer that we read by Jonah, <laughs> that crying out, it's a prayer. What we read about his, his statements in the belly of the fish is saturated in Scripture. Yeah, there's no Scripture verse, you know, reference. But what we find is that Jonah's thoughts were permeated with the Word of God. Let me unpack it for you. In Jonah chapter 2, verse 3, we read, All your waves and breakers swept over me. Check out what Psalm 42, verse 7 says. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. Sound familiar? Jonah chapter 2, verse 4. I have been banished. Compare that with Psalm 31, verse 22. In my alarm, I said, I'm cut off from your sight. Jonah chapter 2, verse 5. He said, the engulfing waters threaten me. Psalm 68 Excuse me, 69 verse 1 says, Save me, God, for the waters have threatened my life. Jonah chapter 2 verse 7, when he said, When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you into your holy temple. Well, Psalm 18 verse 6 says, In my distress I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. Again, Jonah chapter 2 verse 8, 
He said, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Psalm 31 verse 6 says, I hate those who cling to worthless idols. Jonah chapter 2 verse 9 says, salvation comes from the Lord. And Psalm 3, 8 says, salvation belongs to the Lord. I think you get my point. Now, why is this so critical? See, the reason why at first, we at First LG stress so much the importance of reading the Word of God, the Bible, why we even have a Bible plan. By the way, you can get your July and August Bible plan outside. We'd be happy to let you get in on that, and we could teach you how to have daily time in God's Word. Because when we read God's Word and keep God's Word in our lives, David said, I've hidden your Word in my heart so that I do not sin against you. Because what your thoughts are will become your actions. The reason why we often find ourselves in impossible situations is because we've had foolish thoughts. Can I just be raw like that? Have you ever said, how could I be so stupid to be here? I've said that. How about you? Well, to put it blunt, it's because we had stupid thoughts. How do we change our thoughts that are stupid, well, make them scriptural. We make them scriptural. We go back to the scriptures and we allow the word of God to align and change and guide our thoughts. When our thoughts shift in alignment in the direction and the flow of the word of God, our lives will change. One of the things that the, the, the perspectives change. See, the, one of the telltale t- signs of a scripture-saturated individual is that their very perspective of life changes. Let me, let me explain what I'm talking about in the book of Jonah. Did you notice in verse 6, Jonah said, but you brought me out of the pit. Now, where was Jonah saying all of this? What was his current location? Like if he were to do Life 360 on Jonah, he'd be, he would be in the Mediterranean Sea and the belly of a great fish. But what did he say? You brought me out, my life up from the pit. Brought. Is that present tense or past tense? Past tense. Wait, 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 wait. He was still in the fish. How was he able to say something like that? In fact, later on he says, with thanksgiving. Is this situation a situation of gratitude in terms of the way we would see normally as gratitude? I mean, how many of us ever felt like, oh, I'm inside of a marine creature and I'm all wrapped up. I'm so grateful. I'm being digested. Woo! That's not, okay, because when God's word impacts our lives, when we hold on to it, when we keep it in our lives, hold, what happens is we no longer just see from our perspective, we also get to see life from his. That's why we do not grieve as those who grieve, because we know that we have a hope that endures. That's why Christ followers never live outside of hope. It's not because we don't hurt. Because that's real, right? We go through situations where we hurt. We go through instances where we cry. We go through hard times. We go through situations where, oh. but here's the thing. When the word of God is impacting our lives, our very thoughts go into a different alignment to the point our perspective expands beyond just a normal perspective, but also a scriptural God perspective. That's why we live differently. That's why we respond differently. And so how do you get out of an impossible situation? (laughs) You've got to rely on the word of God. But last but not least, you got to resolve to obey what God says. 
Well, God, to get to there. You got to get to a point where you say, okay, it's no longer I'm going to say that I believe that Jesus is God. No longer do we just say, well, I believe the Bible is true. Somewhere along the line, we have to say, that's true. I know I read about it, but I actually will flesh that out in my life by obeying it, by following Jesus for real. Check out verse 9. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. What I have vowed I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. God restores those who return. God works in and through those determined to obey him. That's a wonderful reality that we can see. See, sacrifice of God is not some religious activity for religious activity's sake. Okay? It's really following through with what God would have us to be and do according to his word. And it's re- repeated. This is, a, this, this is a continuous refrain in the scriptures. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22 says, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Proverbs 21, verse 3 says, To do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, this is what Jesus says, But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. A life that is lived out in the context of who we're supposed to be. For I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. For Jonah, specifically it meant, I will go to Nineveh. See, God told in chapter 1, Jonah, I want you to go and preach and give a message to the Ninevites, these cruel, violent, powerful people. Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, the powerful, most powerful nation in the world at that time. And they were the sworn enemies of the Hebrew people. Jonah didn't want to go there. Nothing he wanted to go there. But at this point, he came to realize, God, you know better than I do. So instead of me continuing to run to Tarshish, which was on the other side of the world from Nineveh, for him... Making good on his vow meant going to Nineveh. I know it's not easy. It's hard. But I'm going to go to Nineveh nonetheless. And the same thing is true for you and me. We're going to come to a point where we actually start resolving to obey instead of feeling like obeying. I don't always feel like exercising. How many of you like begin in the New Year's and say, hey, I feel like, you know, I feel like getting in shape, better shape, best shape of my life this year. I think a lot of us come to that point. You know what happens after about 10 days? I feel like a Krispy Kreme. (laughs) Right? And that's why gym memberships expand in the first month, but they cruise on and make good profit because of all the all of us who are like, give up on our resolutions, right? Sometime in our lives, we need to come to a point where we go beyond what we feel and operate on the basis of fact. Okay? See, the train of obedience when it comes to affecting our emotions goes like this. First is the fact or the truth of God's word. Okay? That always comes first. But when you apply faith to the fact of God, then our feelings will eventually follow. 
But the problem is when we're led by feelings first and place our faith in our feelings, we may or may not be addressing fact. You tracking with me? Are you, am I, are you, yes, no? Yeah. Okay. Um, because what we do is we are a society dominated by what we feel is right. Then coming to the objective reality of what is true and fact. That is why there's so much issue and tension in our society right now. Because we're all about, hey, this is what we feel. I feel like this today. I feel like this, that. No, maybe I'm going to change my mind again. And such a society of gender fluidity, truth fluidity, whatever, it got, it's got to go beyond how we feel. The Bible says, and this is what the scripture clearly tells, you shall know the truth, and it's the truth that will set you free. And God's word is always true. And we need to come to a point where we say, okay, let me obey. And the good news is this. When we do, when we say, I will commit, I will make good on that which I was holding back. For some of you, it may be a relational issue. For others of you, it's a financial thing. I mean, like, oh, I follow Jesus about these other things. I even serve here, but I'm not going to. No, no, my money is my money, God, and don't touch it. And we never tithe. Some of you need to give, make good on all that we said that we are. If you're a follower of Jesus, we make good on all of it in our lives. We need to say, Jesus, here's my life. Trusting that he knows better than we do. And he will lead us to a life that is meaningful and eternally impacting if we will obey. And like I said, when we do, oh, God rescues us from the deep we're in. From the situation, he will pull us to where he needs to be if we'll let him. Because here's what verse 10 says. And the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah on the dry land. He's the only guy that's ever been hurled by an animal. Mm, mm, mm. And this is a reality. You may not like how you could return. Because <laughs> who likes to be spewed chunk, right? But God can bring you back. Because what was happening while Jonah was in the belly of the great fish, in his repentance, that means stop running but returning to the Lord. While he was repenting, the Lord was rescuing. Because the fish didn't stand still. You know what the fish was doing? Swimming back to where Jonah can be right with God and fulfill the mission that God called him to fulfill. See, that's what happens. That's what repentance can do in every one of our lives. See, when he changes us, he repairs our hearts, our minds, our emotions. He may repair relationships. He may even repair financial situations that have been impossible. I don't know, but I know this, that God in his goodness and his grace, while we're repenting, he does his work of rescuing. He brings us back. And when the time is right, and I don't know when that is, for Jonah, it was three days, three nights, the fish went, bleh. And Jonah was such a happy man. <laughs> I'm going to talk more about this next, next week. <laughs> but the bottom line is this. Isn't it time to stop running then? Is it a time to stop running? Is it a time you say, okay, Lord, I'm going to recognize you as the source? 
I'm going to realize what got me here. I want to rely on your word. And I will today begin by resolving to obey. Will you do that? Because if we do, Jonah chapter 3 verse 1 is it something, a reality we can hold on to. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Second time. He's the God of second chances. You ever feel like you've blown your life? God will give you a second chance. He will. He'll give you a third chance. He'll give you a fourth chance. He'll give you a fifth chance. He'll give you a sixth chance. He may even give you seven chances and chances and chances, but he will not give you infinite chances. Because the grace of God is beautiful and amazing. But they may, there will come a time for all of us where we're no longer able to take opportunity, have opportunity to take hold of his grace. So don't count on the fact that you, they will, you will be able to turn sometime down the road. So what I'm going to ask is that you make the decision now because the good news is because you're here, because you're watching, because you are listening to the truth of God's word, it's not too late for you. It's not too late for you. Maybe today's the day you say, okay, Lord, here are my running shoes. I give up. I trust you. And that means I'm going to surrender my life entirely to you. So in just a minute, I'm going to ask our worship team to lead us in a time of response. We're going to all stand up right now. Let's all stand. And we're going to step into a time of response. And if you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, today is that day. Today, you have a chance to come home. Today, Jesus is going to embrace you with open arms. You need to step out of where you're standing after we pray. Come forward, and we'll settle the most important decision you'll ever make. Will we admit that we're a sinner, that we're runners? Believe that Jesus nailed our shame, our sin on the cross. And because he came back to life on the third day, he gives us a new life. A new life. Life full of meaning and significance and eternal impact as we follow him. There may be other decisions you need to make because you've been running in some aspect of your life and you're in an impossible situation. It's difficult. You don't know how you're going to do well, You don't know what to do. Now you do. Recognize the source. Realize what got you here. Rely on his word. And resolve to follow him. Obey him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for what you're teaching us. And I pray that we will open our hearts and our lives. May it be laid bare before you in totality no longer in part would it run straight into your arms. We pray this in Jesus' name.